We will take this video of us right now and actually put it onto the video. <laughs> Whatever, you'll show me. My name is Joel Cohen. I'm professor of populations at the Rockefeller University and at Columbia University in New York City. Why should you consider taking a course in demography in college? You will be growing up in the generation where the baby boomers are going into retirement and dying. You will face problems in the aging of the population that have never been faced before. You will hear more and more about migration into the United States and in some cases out into Europe and out, between rural areas and cities. You need to understand as a citizen and as a taxpayer and as a voter what's really behind the arguments. I want to tell you about the past, present, and future of the human population. So let's start with a few problems. Right now, a billion people are chronically hungry. That means they wake up hungry, they're hungry all day, and they go to sleep hungry. A billion people are living in slums. Not the same billion people, but there's some overlap. Living in slums means they don't have tenure in their homes. They don't have infrastructure to take the garbage away. They don't have secure water supplies to drink. Nearly a billion people are illiterate. Try to imagine your life being illiterate. You can't read the labels on the bottles in the supermarket if you could get to a supermarket. That is fascinating to me. Illiteracy has gone down. Or in other words, literacy has gone up. What did that? Huh. It was not an accident. It was a concerted drive to bring universal primary education to all. That took place in round numbers over the last quarter of the 20th century. What, what was accomplished was al almost universal schooling. Unfortunately, in many cases, this did not include real competence in reading and understanding a sentence. But there was a tremendous increase in the fraction of school age children who were in schools. And at the beginning of the 20th century, we seemed kind of stuck at universal primary education. And so I had the good fortune to have support from the director of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and funding from the Hewlett Foundation to have a project for 10 years on extending universal primary education through universal secondary education. And there were two books that came out of that. This one is called Educating All Children. And this includes economic, political, and other analysis of what the issue is. And then the question is, what are you gonna teach them and why? And this was a second book 
called International Perspectives on the Goals of Universal, Basic, and Secondary Education. The question addressed here, we have 15 or 20 chapters by people from around the world saying, where do we want to go with universal education? Mm. And people want to go in different directions. And so that's informative to see what values people want to instill, respect for tradition or desire for change, for example, a fundamental choice or both. So I applaud the fantastic progress that has been made in spreading literacy and education. What I lament here is that there's still a billion people who can't read. What the heck? Everybody should be able to read. Two thirds of those people who are illiterate are women. And about 200 to 215 million women don't have access to the contraceptives they want so that they can control their own fertility. This is not only a problem in developing countries. About half of all pregnancies are unintended. Demography gives you the tools to address and to understand these problems. It's the study of populations of humans and non-human species. That includes viruses like influenza, the bacteria in your gut, plants that you eat, animals that you enjoy or that provide your domestic animals. And it includes non-living objects like light bulbs and taxi cabs and buildings because these are also populations. And it includes the study of these populations in the past, present, and future, away from the car. using quantitative data and mathematical models as tools of analysis. I see demography as a central subject related to economics, to human well-being as in material terms, related to the environment, to the well-being of the other species with which he shares a planet, and culture, which affects our values and how we interact with one another. The key fact you need to remember is that since the inventions of agriculture between 6,000 and 14,000 years ago, the population of the Earth the human population has grown 1,000-fold. From approximately 7 million, maybe 14,000 years ago, to nearly 7 billion this year. Put three zeros on the end. Of 7 million, you get 7 billion. Over the same interval, the Earth has not gotten any bigger. The continents haven't expanded a thousandfold or at all. The oceans are the same size as they were before. The atmosphere is the same size as it was before. So the question that concerns a lot of people and me is whether the impacts that 7 billion people or more in the future will have on the Earth will endanger our own well-being and the well-being of other species on the Earth. We know that humans have already caused the extinction of many species. Question is, is that going to come back and bite us? And if so, in what ways? Demography provides us with a reliable way to imagine and to reimagine the future. So let's get down to some nitty gritty details here. About 2,000 years ago, there were roughly a quarter of a billion people on the planet. Today, there are almost 7 billion. More than six-sevenths of that growth, in fact, more than six-sevenths of the growth since the beginning of humans 50,000 years ago. The 50,000 years ago origin of modern humans has been pushed back 
over the last decade. And there are some arguments that essentially modern humans existed as long as 300,000 years ago. I am agnostic on that. I don't know. But the 50,000 number is probably too low. What's interesting about it, in my point of view, the last interglacial, that is period between ice ages, was around 115 to 130,000 years ago. If modern humans existed only 100,000 years ago, then they hadn't previously experienced an interglacial, which is what we're in now, a warm period. If the origin is 300,000 years ago, then they've experienced at least one, the Eemian, which is the name of the previous interglacial, or one more maybe before that. That means that the ecological experience of humans would be quite different from a more recent origin. And I, I haven't seen a full discussion of what the consequences of that would be for us. More than six sevenths of the growth since the beginning of humans 50,000 years ago has occurred in the last 200 years. To go from a quarter of a billion to half a billion took 16 centuries. So we reached about half a billion humans, about 1,600, more or less. The human population of the Earth, if it were growing exponentially, would go from a quarter of a billion to half in 16 centuries and from half to one in another 16 centuries. What actually happened was that the human population of the Earth reached a billion around 1,800 because of foodstuffs that came from the new world to the old, notably potato and corn or maize. And because many of the people who were overcrowded in Europe went to America where there were fertile and unoccupied lands to use. It, it wasn't unoccupied. That, that was a serious mistake. So the East-West exchange, the Columbian exchange across the Atlantic, liberated population growth in the European sector. There was a similar development in Japan, an acceleration of population growth around the same time. In 1800, the Industrial Revolution began, and the population doubled from 1 billion to 2 billion by 1930, 1927, we don't know exactly. Why don't we know exactly? Because we didn't have censuses that covered the whole world at that time. So it's a retrospective guess. So our doubling times went from 1,600 years to 200 years, 1,600 to 1,800, to 130 years, 1,800 to 1930. The next doubling from 2 billion to 4 billion took only 44 years, 1974. So until the last half century, human population growth has been faster than exponential. But this slide that you've been looking at is like a shower curtain. What it reveals is a little less interesting than what it conceals. And so I'd like to zoom in on the part of history from 1950 to now. We've zoomed in to the last 50 years. The red vertical line on the slide is now. And it begins on the left side in 1950 and runs up to 2011. And what you see is that the annual population growth rate reached a peak of about 2.1% per year in the years 1965 to 1970, and since then has fallen by half to about 1.1% per year. So for the last 
2,000 years at least, except for the Black Death in the 14th century, the population growth rate was going up, 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 up. And around 1965, it began to decline. If you look, there's a sharp dip before 1965, a very sharp valley. That is the great leap forward in China, which killed about 30 million people unnecessarily. But the global peak of 2.1% per year has since led to a decline by a half. So in absolute terms and in percentage terms, the number of people we're adding to the planet has begun to slow. Since 1950, humans have made the swiftest voluntary change in reproduction in human history. Around 1950, the average number of children per woman per lifetime was very close to five. Today, the average number of children per woman is about 2.5 or 2.6. In other words, billions of people have changed their reproductive behavior to lower the number of children born in a lifetime from five to two and a half, but not everywhere. In sub-Saharan Africa, the decline has been much less, from perhaps 6.6 .6 children to 5.1 over the second half of the 20th century. To understand the consequences of this fall to two and a half children per woman, you need to know what is meant by replacement level fertility. So I am going to introduce that by telling you about the theory of bathtubs. A regular bathtub with no stopper. Water comes in and water goes out. Now, water coming in corresponds to births, to the earth. And water going out corresponds to death. And the level of the bathtub corresponds to the total population size. So, if the number of births just matches the number of deaths, the population stays steady, and that's the replacement level fertility. Now, you're asking yourself, what is the replacement level of fertility? The answer is about 2.1 children per woman. This is a very good addition. There has been an amazing transformation in the distribution of fertility across the world in the last half century. I want you to look carefully at this slide. The vertical line is replacement level fertility. The horizontal axis is total fertility rate, children per woman per lifetime. And the vertical axis is the percent of world population. So it's zero at the bottom, a quarter, half, 75% and 100% at the top. In 1950, the black line that's at the bottom, practically everywhere, women were having more than replacement level fertility. They are on the right of the red line. By 1975, roughly, a quarter of women had moved to the left of replacement and three quarters were still over to the right. In 2003, this was not in any newspaper anywhere, but it was a very important event. In 2003, half of all the women in the world were having replacement level or less. They moved to the left of the red line. 
And now more than half of humanity lives in a country at or below replacement level fertility. It's the first time in human history that this has happened, and it's important. But you remember that the total fertility rate, the average number of children per woman, is at 2.5, not 2.1. And that's because on this curve, the green curve, the folks with high fertility are further to the right of the red line than most of the folks with low fertility are to the left. So the average is skewed to the right. So we still have a growing population. But this change is continuing. And how fast it continues is something that you, as voters, as potential scientists, as citizens, will influence by what you choose to do about the 215 million women who have an unmet need for contraception. So much for the past. Let's go on to the present. This is a population pyramid. It's one of the basic descriptive tools of demography, and you should understand what it is. Let's start with the left side of the picture. The horizontal axis, the width of the bar, tells you how many people there are. And the vertical axis corresponds to age group. So the lowest bar is for people aged 0 to 4, with males on the left and females on the right. The next bar is people aged 5 to 9. The top bar is 85 or 90. And what you see is that in the rich countries, there are about as many people aged, let's say, 0 to 4, as there are aged 85 or 90 but it's basically a slender column. Now compare it with the age pyramid for the poor countries. The base of the pyramid is enormous compared to the number of elderly. So there are many more workers to support the elderly per elderly person. The width of the bar, again, is number of people. So in the ranges from five to 14 or five to 19, that's the school age population. It means that the challenge of educating those children is much greater in the developing countries than it is in the rich countries because those bars keep getting wider as the developing countries pump in more children at the bottom of the pyramid. The age groups move up with time as they get older. And so the larger school age population is followed 10 years later by a much larger military age population. So if you look at the age groups 15 to 30, you can see that the potential military force in the developing countries vastly exceeds that in the rich countries. It doesn't mean it's military power for them. It means they can afford a military engagement in a way that the human resources of the rich countries make very difficult, increasingly difficult. So where's the growth going? The demographic growth is happening in the countries that can least afford to deal with the additional population. What's the average income? The reason we call the rich countries rich is that their average income is about $32,000 a year per person. And in the poor countries, it's about $5,000 a year. This is a big problem, this inequity. It's actually not as extreme as I thought. The richest 10% takes 52% of the income. But that's income, not wealth. The inequality in wealth is extraordinary. Income is much more evenly distributed than wealth. Wealth is the accumulation of income, okay? It's the integral. It's much more unequal because it is a cumulative advantage. Hmm. If I have a high annual income, I get a credit card that gives me cash back because they want my business. 
So things actually cost me less than a poor person. What fraction of people are living on less than $2 a day? Nobody lives on less than $2 a day in the rich countries, and 51%, just about half, in the poor countries. In other words, about 3.5 billion people on our planet are living on $2 a day or less. You might ask yourself, if things are so bad there, how is it that their population is growing so rapidly? And the fact is that the difference in death rates is much smaller than the difference in fertility rates. So even though a higher fraction of children die before they reproduce, the average number of children that people have when they do reproduce in the poor countries more than compensates for the increase in the death rate. So that's why we have rapid population growth at the same time that we have high mortality because we have even higher fertility. It's an important general question, how does the rich world benefit from the prosperity and development of the poor world? There are lots of different answers you can give. One is purely economic. Richer people in China and Africa will buy more American music CDs and more movies and more software and more high-tech engines from General Electric and more products because they have more means to buy. So that's one kind of an answer. A second is public health. There are millions of flights in both directions from the poor countries to the rich countries every year. And the microbes don't know about passports. And they cross from Mumbai to New York just as fast as they go from New York to Mumbai. And when there are outbreaks of drug-resistant tuberculosis, those can travel around the world and they pose a danger to me and to you guys. So we have an interest in the health and well-being, a direct personal interest in the health and well-being of people in poor countries. So now we've talked about the demographic past and the demographic present. And next we're going to talk about the demographic future. Woody Allen said, eternity is very long, especially near the end. So we're not going to talk about eternity. We are only going to talk about the near-term future. How much of the future is relevant to you? Well, according to the United States Life Tables published by the National Center for Health Statistics, an 18-year-old in the United States in the year 2011 has a 91% chance of surviving to 2050, 91%, based on survival rates in 2006. If you behave wisely, and if economic and medical progress continue, you have at least that good a chance of making it to 2050. So we're going to talk about the world from now to 2050. I can say with confidence that four things will happen over the next 40 years or so. The world's population will get bigger. It will grow more slowly. It will be older in the sense that the fraction of older people will increase dramatically and it will be more urban. And I'm going to go through each of those four to explain some of the details. What we don't know too much about is what will be the future of migration, the future of household structures, and the future of families. We have some ideas about that, but that's relatively less certain. This graph shows curves of the history and future 
population out to 2050. At the top, the curve shows the anticipated population if fertility remains at the level it is today and there's no further decline in fertility. That's called the constant fertility assumption. And it shows that the world would go to about 11 billion people by 2050. However, if fertility drops as it has dropped in the past, the medium projection of the UN population division is that population would rise to about 9.1 billion by 2050. So that's a difference of 2 billion. In other words, we're counting on a continuing decline in fertility to lower the population size by about 2 billion by 2050. What we do between now and 2050 will have a huge impact on how difficult it is to feed, house, shelter, educate, and provide health for the billions of people on the planet in 2050. It will affect an enormous range of human problems. It's possible that population growth would end before 2100, depending on the choices we make now. What choices am I talking about? Choices like educating women, providing credit to women in countries where women are not now allowed to have credit, providing reproductive health care so that women are not forced, as they are in some countries, to have children when they don't want to, raising the age at marriage so that 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 14-year-olds aren't put into marriage. There's a lot of things we can do to raise people, including even women, raise people's control over their own lives. And we should be doing those things. The second fact about the future is that the population is going to grow more slowly. The slowing will depend on what we do now. By 2050, in the medium projection from the United Nations Population Division, the world will be growing by 31 million people a year. What's it doing now? It's growing by 76 million people a year. In the poor countries, population will be growing by 32 million a year, while in the rich countries, population will actually be declining by a million people a year. Already today, in 2011, population is declining in more than 50 countries. Not well known. What's happening here is a shift in childbearing desires and action from quantity to quality. As people urbanize, as people get educated, as wealth improves, people are making greater investments in a smaller number of children. That is very fascinating to me. What, what specifically? Specifically the drop in rich country childbearing amount and the idea of it going from quantity to quality, because mm -hmm. that indicates to me a, a real change in the trajectory of the human being. It's a much more potent transmission from generation to generation. The potential of that transition is really not fully understood, but it's enormous. Hmm. Enormous for education, for health, for cultural change. So we've talked about population size, growth rate. The next is aging. So by 2050, there will be about three times as many elderly as children. This is the first time in human history that the elderly population has outnumbered the young population. So what? Who cares? Well, aging affects energy demand. So even if you're interested in the environment, you need to know about the age structure of populations. Older householders, at least in the United States, India, and China, the three countries where it's been studied in detail, spend more than younger households, measured by the age of the head, on utilities, services, and health care. Utilities are the most energy-intensive part of the household budget. 
That's not the only reason to care. The rise in the fraction of elderly poses an increasing challenge to a relatively reduced number of workers. And it's possible that the well-being of elderly people could improve if they're educated or could get worse if they are warehoused in old people's homes. We know, for example, that people who are educated in their youth have much lower disability when they get older. And in fact, disability rates at any given age in the United States have been dropping by about 1.5% per year for the last 25 years. So there are far fewer disabled elderly now than there used to be. That's the meaning of 60 is the new 40, 50 is the new 30. Uh, I believe life expectancy has dropped further since the last year here, 2017, as a consequence of COVID. We've lost a million people. But as this slide makes very clear, the trend began before that. Agnes Deaton and Anne Case at Princeton call these deaths of despair. And they were principally driven by deaths in the white middle class in the 50 to 60 age range with increasing use of lethal opioid drugs. So it the drop in life expectancy preceded COVID. COVID has aggravated the despair of people at the same time that it has killed many elderly in facilities for them, and recently more young people as they've become careless in their own self-care. It is a very bad signal of dysfunction in this society. And I don't see a lot of signs that people are paying serious attention to it. People are healthier at older ages. That's a result of investment in education in youth. So there are policy implications for a rising aged population. We better invest in educating people when young. And the last of the four topics is cities. And I'm going to give you a very simplified and boiled down demographic history of the first half of the 21st century. In 2000, you could divide the world into two equal parts, half rural and half urban. So that was about 3 billion rural and 3 billion urban. In 2050, the rural population will still be at 3 billion and the urban population will have doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion. All of those additional 3 billion urban people will be in poor countries. The equivalent of a city of 1 million people will have to be built every five days from now to 2050 
and all of them in poor countries. So what's the consequence? What does this massive shift towards urbanization mean? If we underinvest in cities, we can go from a billion people living in slums today to four billion people living in slums. And if we invest in the cities, if the real estate companies realize the opportunities, the incredible demand that people have to live in decent housing, we could reduce the size of the slums. So I cannot give you a deterministic picture. I can tell you what's, what would be awful. We could have infectious diseases rampant. We could have warfare in the cities. We could have disorder. But that's not necessary. We could have clean water supplies. We could have security for people in their houses. That doesn't get as much news attention. But the point I want to make is we have choices about the future of cities. And many things about urbanization are positive. And I want to tell you a few of the things that are positive, not because they're automatic, but because they are positive in fact and because we can enhance the positive. Compared to rural areas, urban areas have lower fertility rates. Why? I'm a woman on the farm. You might not think so, but I am. Okay, I'm a woman on the farm. The more children I have, the more help I can have in collecting the water, collecting the firewood, and attending to the goats and sheep. As soon as I move into a city, those children convert from an asset to a liability. I have to buy them clothing. I have to send them to school. There are school fees. The apartment is too small. The incentives completely shift direction. Urbanization makes people want to have fewer children. Cities also have higher usage of modern contraception and lower unmet needs for contraception. Why? I am a woman. You might not know it. I don't have to walk 15 miles to the nearest health center and be exposed to the inspection of my husband's friends when I go in for contraception. No, when I'm in the city, I just go around a corner and it's anonymous. So urbanization brings many features of liberation as well as changing the incentives. Cities concentrate economic productivity. 80% of the world's gross domestic product is produced in cities, although there are only 50% of the world's people in cities. Cities generate cultural assets, educational resources, public health resources, medical care, and they can promote energy efficiency. Let me give an example. This graph shows the passenger transport carbon dioxide per person. The denser the city, the lower the amount of carbon dioxide per person. New York City is reported, according to the mayor's office, to have less than one-third the carbon dioxide emissions per person of the U.S. average. People take the subway. People ride the bus. Cities also have hazards. Many cities are built along coastlines. Coastlines are where the continental plates of the oceans collide with the continents. That means they are prone to earthquakes. We just had the big example in Japan, but it's true all around the world. The ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean coincides with where the cities are because cities are coastal. A lot of the world's urban people live near the coastline, and that's where the subduction zones are in California. I'm going to show you three slides of New York City where I live. 
This is New York City as it is now. The red zone will be underwater if the water level rises by one meter on the average. One meter is probably more than we'll have in the next 50 years, but could easily happen by the end of the century at current rates. Now, a six meter rise would happen if the Greenland and Antarctic ice masses melted. Six meters is about 20 feet. That would be a catastrophe in many respects, including for me, there's a little place over here in New Jersey, which is my favorite nudist colony, and it would be completely underwater. So that would be a terrible thing to happen. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Vulnerable to rising sea level, to coastal storms. Excuse seasons. me, pause. You realize that that's a joke because if that beach is underwater, you can find another beach at the higher level. It's just a joke, but I thought it would be funny. So cities are vulnerable to rising sea level, to coastal storms. Cities concentrate people, so they're vulnerable to infectious diseases, water supply attacks, and cities are excellent targets for military and terrorist attacks, as we know in New York City and many other cities. Used to be battles were fought on battlegrounds. No more. They're fought in cities. And that will increasingly be the case as cities concentrate assets. Urban growth could affect the food supply. Right now, cities occupy 3% of the land surface of the earth. The arable land, the land where we can grow food well, is about 10 or 11% of the land surface of the earth. It's not surprising that many cities are smack in the middle of the best arable land, because that was where a food surplus could be easily produced without having to ship the food. Now, if cities are gonna double, we have another choice. Do we double the area from 3% to 6% and eat up our arable land, literally, or do we double the density and keep the areas of the cities constant at 3%? This is a choice for the future, and it depends on zoning and culture and real estate developers and economics and choices that we make as citizens. How do we address the problems we have? There are three kinds of solutions that people have put forward. Bigger pie, fewer forks, better manners. The bigger pie people say we should use technology to increase production. The fewer forks people say we should use contraception to reduce population growth and we should consume less material products. And the better manners people say, we should eliminate violence, inequities between men and women, inequities between rich and poor, inequities between young and old. We should eliminate irrational subsidies and just make things work more efficiently, get rid of corruption. I took a few years to try to figure out what's my best way to support those three strategies, all of them. And I came to the conclusion that the best response would be to educate all children, boys and girls, well for 10 to 12 years, high quality primary and secondary education. I realized there's no chance of educating people if their brains haven't been fed adequately in utero and after birth, especially for the first three years. So I am now moving around to working on the problem of getting food, adequate, good food, to pregnant women, lactating women, and infants up to the age of three. Because there are many countries where by the time a child gets to school, it's too late. The brain has lost its capacity to learn. So now we're talking about food. I started this conversation saying that there are a billion hungry people, chronically hungry. I want to come back to this. We depend on other species 
Here is a list of what other species provide to humans. And I'm going to read the list because it's important. Food for people, feed for our domestic animals, fuel, biofuel, for example, and wood to burn, biomass. And in many countries, people burn dung, the waste products of animals. That's an important source of fuel. Fiber, so we depend on trees for many paper and other products. Fascination, we love to go to the zoo and see animals. We love to see wildlife. When people go out in nature, they're thrilled if they see a deer or some other kind of wildlife. In fact, in Central Park, the German tourists are thrilled to see squirrels. We find animals fascinating. Pharmaceuticals, most of our drugs are natural products tuned up to serve human needs. Animals provide transport. They carry people places. They provide traction. They pull plows. They pull carts. Other species provide symbioses. I've talked about the animals, not the animals, the bacteria that live in our guts. And they provide infection. They can cause disease. So the question I want to address now is, can we grow enough food to bring us to 2050 without catastrophe. These are data from the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. They are estimates of the number of people in the world who are chronically undernourished day after day. The current estimate is about 925 million people. That's nearly a billion, and it is higher than the number has been in the last 40 years. Ninety-eight percent of these people live in poor countries. Not only poor countries. Here is something that shocked me, and I hope it will shock you. At some point during 2009, 17.4 million U.S. households, one household in seven in the United States, lacked enough money and other resources to provide enough food for all members of the household. The current level of food insecurity in the United States is higher than it has been since the USDA started collecting these statistics by sample surveys in 1995. We are at an all-time high of hunger in this country. So the question you should be asking yourself is, well, Aren't we growing enough food? What's the problem? The answer is less than half of the grain that we grow goes into people's mouths. Divide the world's grain into six equal pieces. One piece we use to make biofuels, starches for seed and other industrial uses, plastics. Two sixths we feed to our domestic animals of the rich people, those who have the means to afford those animals and meat products. Less than half the other three sixths goes directly into human mouths. We could be feeding 11 billion, but we only feed half of that amount, five and a half billion, into human mouths. We put machines and animals in line before people who don't have money to express demand in markets. Hunger doesn't fit into our economic theories. It's economically invisible because people who are very poor can't enter the market and plunk down their cash and say, I want that. They are invisible economically. So my hunger does not affect your costs for grain. This is a problem with our economics. And it's a reflection of our values. Do we value the hunger of other people? So here's Joel's formula for how to solve the world's problems. Well, population. Let's go at it with all hammer and tongs. Eliminate unintended pregnancies and educate all children to give people control over their bodies and their own lives. Economics. 
opened credits and markets to small farmers, a majority of the world's farmers are women. They are the ones out in the field actually doing the work. Eliminate perverse subsidies. Subsidies in rich countries make it very difficult for poor farmers to enter markets because they lower the price in artificial ways. And let's raise the incomes of the poor. Environment. Use the best farmlands for farms and internalize the external costs of agriculture. Get rid of the pollution and use chemicals in a way that doesn't damage the environment. Fourth, culture. Promote healthy diets and value adequate nutrition for every person. I would add one other thing under this culture question, and that is we need to fund more research in agricultural productivity for the crops that matter in poor countries, not only for the industrial crops that fund our biofuel habit, but for the crops that provide food to the poor. When you walk away from this conversation, I hope that you'll remember that population interacts with economics, the environment, and culture so that you immunize yourself against people who will try to sell you an overly simple bill of goods. And there are a lot of people. There are people who say demography is destiny. All we have to do is get a contraceptive in every pot and we'll solve the world's problems. That's wrong. And there are people who say, all we have to do is get the market right. Let the market take care of all the prices. In my view, that is equally wrong and much more dangerous. There are people who say, it's only a matter of law and getting the laws right. Yeah, but it's also a matter of technology and contraception and economics. And there are people who say, forget about the people. Let's just save the environment. I don't believe that because I'm a human being and I value other human beings. We've got to get all of these things working together. And the environment can be on the side of human well-being because poor rural people depend directly on the environment for their sustenance. If they want to have a sustainable sustenance, they have to have a sustainable environment. Demography makes it possible to imagine and to reimagine the future. I'd encourage any freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, adult, high school student, I'm not age prejudiced, anybody, to consider demography. It's not the only field that offers these attractions, but it does offer them in spades. It's really very attractive. First of all, demography gives you tools and analytical perspectives to understand better the world around you. Secondly, it gives you equipment to solve problems mentally. And third, it is the means to intervene more wisely and more effectively in the real world to improve the well-being, not only of yourself, important as that may be, but of people around you and of other species with whom we share the planet. So it's, it prepares you to go out and do something that's worth doing for a larger good than only yourself. So there's an old saying, if I am not for myself, who will be? But if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So now is the time. Pull up your pants and get to work. Thank you. The idea for this film originated entirely with an eccentric billionaire who had the crazy idea that people who understood their fields could summarize the most important points in one hour. And he put up the money. This dressing me up as a woman was not my idea. I was shocked when I saw that. <laughs> but it works. And it's very funny. <laughs>